Ben and Miller always seek simplicity in his work. For a director so desperate to find the ordinary, it's somewhat ironic that his films are now anything but that. In fact, one can argue that he's revolutionized nonfiction filmmaking and upended the status quo in the film industry. Yet so many moviegoers barely recognize his name. Why is that? Perhaps it's by design. Miller himself admits to living a low-key lifestyle dedicated to blending in. He doesn't drive around New York in a Ferrari or wear the latest fashions. Miller keeps things simple, and that simplicity bleeds into his work. The only issue is that it somehow creates the opposite effect. That's what I want to explore today. How a director who strives to be simple goes unnoticed when he makes fast waves. For instance, Miller's first feature-length film was a documentary drama spotlighting the life of Tim Speed Levitch. Miller was working to help support the homeless community of New York, considered leaving the film industry altogether. Levitch was a semi-homeless man couch-surfing his way from borough to borough while guiding bus tours around the city. The first 70 hours of footage never made it to the cutting room. Miller nearly shot the film twice before settling on a storyline. So what does that say about this director? Well, for stars, I think we can all agree he's a bit of an obsessive. He strives to make his films as close to his vision as possible. What's more, Levitch is the first of his many main characters displaced from the standard. He knows New York. He breathes the architecture and lives the memories of a city that sleeps better than he does. Yet Levitch isn't an accepted betrayal of the everyday New Yorker. Politicians would call him a leech or an issue in the community, but Miller shows us that's not true. See, the root of the story is exact. We're profiling a man displaced in the city he loves. However, the layers breed a complexity that even Miller shies away from interpreting for the viewer. For one, The Cruise is considered the birthplace of modern documentary storytelling through digital mediums. After all, Miller shot the film on a digital camera. Nowadays, that doesn't mean much, but it was a new concept at the time. Additionally, Levitch isn't considered a typical character in nonfiction film. For the longest time, name recognition meant everything. You either made a film about an important person or an important issue. Here, Miller shunts the topic and focuses on one of the people affronted by it. This film's face value tells us one thing. We can settle on that and enjoy ourselves. In fact, Miller wants you to take a simple story and walk away. To him, that means he did his job. Beneath that is the layers of the movie's politics and innovation we never take the time to notice. It's just one way Miller makes waves. He twists and flex a core principle of movie making into something slightly to the side. It's not a change you notice without staring long enough to see the man behind the camera. There's just one problem. The Cruise is his only documentary at this time. As I'm making this video, it's confirmed he's working on the second documentary of his career. So while documentaries tell us a lot about a filmmaker, let's skip ahead to his first big budget film he took on. Now, Moneyball wasn't his child. The studio signed him to play Steven Sonnenberg. So Sonnenberg was essentially trying to make this super expensive documentary with these odd recreated scenes, if I'm being real with you guys. Regardless, joining Miller was Aaron Sorkin, who provided rewrites and Miller's editor for Capote, Christopher Tellison, helped re-edit the film. Together, the three worked on reshaping the narrative and overall direction of Moneyball. Now you're probably way more familiar with this movie. Michael Lewis and Aaron Sorkin sort of help with the popularity, but there's a lot more to this movie. If you haven't, go back and watch this movie. This time, take notice of the editing. Watch how Miller's mise-en-scene helps tell us and communicate concepts quickly. This movie could have been three hours with the information provided by the book. Instead, its subtle glances and set dressing displays the overall theme. The Oakland A's are the underdog. No one believes in Billy Bean, and this team doesn't belong. Once again, we've got a simple idea. The underdog story in sports is a tale of the oldest time. So how does Bennett Miller make this movie feel different? Well, it's not a sports movie, that's how. Consider all the moments we see the A's actually play baseball in the movie. There's barely any screen time devoted to the actual game of baseball, because deep down, the movie isn't about baseball or even sabermetrics. It's about the struggles Billy Bean goes through to prove he belongs. The oddest part is it doesn't even have a happy ending. Did we all forget the underdog doesn't win in the end? Again, the script and the entity helped drive this home, uh, but let's talk more about the ending. So Billy Bean walks out of the stadium thinking about his offer from the Red Sox. A typical sportsman might go into slow motion here and start telling us about how he turned down the money. 
Instead, we get this partially abstract edit of him driving down the filmway, something we've seen him do several times, and he puts on his daughter's CD and listens. The last words spoken in the film are, you're such a loser, dad. That's the reality of Moneyball. They lost, but our protagonist doesn't care. He has his daughter and he's going to just enjoy the show. Here, the macho Billy we see is merged with the father figure we see him be during those inner cut scenes in the story structure. They finally serve their purpose in the story and round out the message we're supposed to be getting. Okay, so clearly Miller is the kind of guy who likes to make something more out of something less. So what's the point of it all? I want to think a movie like Foxcatcher brilliantly sums up Ben Miller as a director. The concept for this film fell on his lap when a fan of the crews gave him documents and reporting about the murder of gold medalist Dave Schultz by disgraced arms dealer John DuPont. The raw material was a lot to work through. The truth is that Moneyball happened before this movie because Miller couldn't get funding for it. Think about that. This movie almost fell off a cliff because executive producers didn't think it was worth the investment. Once again, Miller proved the skeptic was wrong. Foxcatcher received critical praise and film festival awards building up to a successful Oscars campaign. The film he struggled to make for over half a decade proved to be worth it. But wait, you know this already. What did Miller's crew do to make this film stand out then? It's the same formula he played out in Moneyball, only with darker tones. Here, Miller was more control of the script and the direction from the beginning. It's why this film feels on pace with Kabodi and dissimilar to Moneyball. The aspects that bring out a realized vision here are the cinematography and the direction for the actors. So let's break this down a little more. Watch how the wrestling moments play out here. There are early moments with Dave and Mark Schultz practicing that feel intimate and focused, literally, on the two brothers. Later on in the film, there's a discussion between Dave and John that speaks volumes about the relationships playing on the story. Now we open up with Dave and Mark running drills, only John is the focus. The lens choice and staging makes him the dominant person in the frame, and they hover over an out of focus Mark. Dave comes over and the two begin to talk while Mark hangs imperfectly in the frame. Notice how the scene doesn't cut to close shots of John and Dave here, it lingers. And when it finally does cut, it does so to a solo framing of Mark, right before they bring him up more. It's almost as if DP Greg Frazier wants Mark to speak up for himself here. Instead, we know he's in on the conversation thanks to the staging, still we're given this awkward disillusion effect, just by the way it's shot and edited. Of course, Frazier's realistic color palette and dark and saturation help the overall tone in the scene as well, and the film, but there's more to this. It's also in the acting. Now, Miller isn't David Fincher. He doesn't run takes endlessly seeking the perfect laptop smashing moment. He does, however, continue to experiment and push his scene's comfort level. While shooting, Miller would often get close to Steve Carell, Mark Ruffalo, and Channing Tatum to secretly direct them opposite of expectations just to gauge reactions. None of these men are comfortable with one another. Miller made sure the actors never felt comfortable either, and trusting each other or the scene's direction was not an option. Let's be real, it takes a skilled director to pull that out of cast and not have that go south. The entire crew was strained to their limits working on this project. However, the end product is masterful. The mood and the point is setting in there, just waiting for you to unwrap it. Look at it this way. If you never knew what happened in real life, you can gather by the end something dreadful will happen. I'd argue a lot of that is baked into the movie's look and the actor's performances. It's wild that Miller could even piece this all together given all the fragments, and given the time it took him just to get this film moving. I just want to leave you with some kind of summary of all these partially incoherent ramblings. All I'm trying to say is Miller doesn't try to be different. He tries to be himself and tell stories that model his perspective. See, he's like a lot of his protagonists in a way. He's not entirely comfortable sitting in the director's chair, and he takes unorthodox paths to create the results he desires. All that effort builds into this stunning contrast compared to his peers. So while it may not stand out to every person who enjoys his films, his work is worth taking a more in-depth look into to realize all the deep layers he keeps barely under the surface. You'll find his casual pacing rewards the patient viewer, and that's something we can all get beyond. So if you liked this video, be sure to give me a like and subscribe to my channel. I also have a Patreon page if you want to see more content and support me there. Finally, here's a clue for my next video.